Hello everyone, as um, you may be aware by this point, I'm Florence, um, and I'm going to be talking about labour conditions in commercial archaeology and video game development. And kind of the inspiration for me to do this was essentially because I have worked in commercial archaeology pretty much my entire kind of working life. Um, and I kind of was starting to draw comparisons between the bad conditions in commercial archaeology and what I heard about in video game development. Um, of course, they are very different industries, I'm not going to say they're kind of that similar, um, but that was sort of the starting point. Um, and here I've just got a screenshot from a game called The Bradwell Conspiracy, um, which um, I really love because it's got a lot of these kind of like satirical sort of like posters in it because it's set within like this research laboratory that's below Stonehenge. Uh, which is kind of interesting from an archaeological point of view um, and it's all about kind of like oh we're this like happy family corporation but actually um, it's quite uh, not like that <laughs> shall we say. Um, so <laughs> let's start and uh, play the game of capitalism. So essentially a theme that's going to go through this presentation is that capitalism is an ideology, it's not something that's inevitable and it's something that we should and can critique. Um, and so to that end, I'm going to begin by looking at kind of histories of video game development and commercial archaeology. And of course, this timeline is very, um, it's a very generalized, simplified thing. And as I was doing it, I was thinking, you know, this kind of, it, it, what does it actually show you? Kind of not a lot, but maybe that's kind of the point of the exercise. We've been talking about kind of the idea of people being left out of narratives and the past being political. And even as an individual kind of doing a presentation like this, I was thinking, what kind of choices are, am I making in doing this simplified timeline? Um, but really the main things I kind of wanted to draw out were the fact that um, video game development is relatively very recent, as I'm sure many of you are aware. Um, but also that there are kind of these sort of um, military origins of um, video game development. Um, for example, at the uh, Los Alamos Laboratory, um, back in 1952, they developed a game of blackjack on the same computers that they were doing sort of military research. And it was because, you know, they were kind of bored and in between what they were doing, they ended up trying to see if they could use this technology to create blackjack. And I think that's very interesting. It's kind of people playing around their actual work roles and that then eventually down the line becoming a whole industry of its own. Um, of course, that's not the only, that's not the point of inception, but it's just kind of one of many. Um, and I've also included this picture of women working on a production line from 1980. Um, because I think this is, as I was saying earlier, one aspect of video game history that's kind of overlooked all the time. We don't necessarily look at different people's roles in the actual physical production of video games, for example, um, and especially women and um, people of colour as well. Um, so I was kind of interested to find that. So, and now on to commercial archaeology, um, but in the UK. So again, as I was make, doing this presentation, thinking, okay, how am I going to kind of do this positive history of commercial archaeology? It's so broad. And then eventually I ended up kind of focusing on the UK because that's my background. Then it made me realise, well, that, <laughs> that's kind of, you know, it's very specific. And also it's an interesting contrast with um, kind of these general histories of video game development that you get that are much more kind of global often, still probably quite Western centric sometimes. Um, but if you contrast that with sort of archaeology, you often get these very like nation based histories of archaeology, which again is about kind of like the political context, right? It kind of links back with national identity. Um, and again, you kind of get this military influence on archaeology as you do on video games, um, kind of, as has already been mentioned, the kind of colonial um, antiquarian background to archaeology. You've got people like um, Pitt Rivers and Mortimer Wheeler who were kind of involved in the military as well as archaeology. And they, they're kind of seen in these big kind of like fathers of archaeology and things like that. Um, and my time on a kind of jump majorly, as you can see, to 1973. Um, <laughs> because um, I wanted to just kind of highlight um, the formation of the Department of Urban Archaeology in London. And that was kind of out of this um, context of rescue archaeology when there was a fear that um, archaeology was going to be completely removed by excavation of these really deep basements in the city of London at that time. Um, and actually, they managed to get government funding to do that work. 
which is interesting because then you get in 1990, the PPG uh, 16 um, legislation comes in, which essentially introduced what's called polluter pays kind of legislation, which means the developer is responsible for um, in finding an archaeological contractor to do the work of recording, mitigating the damage of the development. And so um, quite a few people see this as kind of almost like the beginnings of commercial archaeology as we understand it today. Um, it kind of led to lots of different archaeological units um, popping up and then kind of essentially, as I'm sure many people here are aware, this kind of situation where you get the units kind of undercutting each other. It's like a race to the bottom who can get the different tenders. Um, very difficult situation. And I also included this image here of um, archaeologists from the 1980s, um, which I really like because it kind of shows sort of a range of different people that were involved at that time, not necessarily just the kind of like big burly archaeologists that you might think of. Um, so what is the problem? There's a lot of <laughs> problems with um, commercial archaeology and indeed the video game industry and some of them are very similar. So as you may have heard, uh, Mola archaeologists recently um, were on strike over pay um, and poor wages in commercial archaeology are just endemic. It's a huge problem and it's because I say there's this problem of kind of archaeological units always undercutting each other and the work that archaeologists do isn't seen as, it's seen as like a nuisance from the point of view of developers. Um, and that kind of um, perspective is something that I think has almost been like internalized by commercial archaeology as well. Um, there's also just general like precarity, short term contracts, um, things like this. Um, but also sometimes, um, as I've kind of experienced it, the need to work kind of long hours um, that you're not kind of paid for. And on that, um, that kind of le leads into this concept of crunch, which is a, a really huge problem in the video game industry, where essentially um, you're expected to do mandatory overtime, but for no extra pay. It's kind of this idea of like, oh, we're like, you know, the kind of the last few months of um, a game's development, it needs to go out by this date, we have to get it done. People are forced to do these incredibly long um, hours, which is very bad for them. Um, but this comes out of this kind of culture of, oh, if you're working in video games, you really love it, which is generally you probably do. Um, but it's that kind of um, exploitation of passion that I think you get in both video game development and archaeology that I really wanted to draw from both. It's the idea that like, you know, it's a privilege to work for us, so you should be thankful. Um, <laughs> Yeah, which I think is quite toxic. Um, and I found this quote actually um, from a blog post that's from all the way back in 2004 um, from Erin Hoffman. At the time she wrote it anonymously, but um, they, then later it came out that she had written it. Um, and it was about, um, even though she's a game developer, it was about her husband working at EA. And she was saying, when you make your profit calculations and your cost analyses, you know that a great measure of that cost is being paid in raw human dignity. And that, I think, for me, kind of sums up a lot of how I feel about um, kind of just like capitalism and the exploitation of people in both of these industries. Um, this idea that um, you can you can kind of quantify profit and loss, but how do you quantify human pain? Um, so that's where I want to go with that. So capitalism, what do we do about that? Um, Mark Fisher <laughs> wrote a book in 2009 um, called Capitalist Realism, which you may have heard of because it's got that kind of famous quote, which is, oh, it's easier to uh, imagine the end of the world than it is to imagine the end of capitalism. Um, and so the sense that there is no alternative to capitalism, it kind of, it just permeates everything. How do you get away from it? it even changes how you think. Um, and he had these kind of three kind of challenges to that, which I think kind of interesting and possibly really useful from an archaeological and kind of game development point of view, potentially. So the climate crisis, obviously a huge problem. Um, I think that's really beyond this presentation, but there's a lot of interesting work being done within archaeology and even within game studies about that. Also the kind of mental health crisis. Um, this is sort of about how, 
uh, mental health is often seen as kind of this individual problem, which may be a result of sort of like, I don't know, brain chemistry or something like that. It's that kind of idea. But actually, Mark Fisher was saying, yes, there is that. But also think about the wider structural problems that we have in society that are causing people to have mental health problems. Um, and this is kind of another thing that you can kind of put on to say, look, capitalism is essentially um, making people's lives unbearable. <laughs> um, and then also this kind of interesting one of bureaucracy. Um, essentially, the kind of one of the promises of capitalism was supposed to be that it would be more efficient. You wouldn't get bogged down in bureaucracy, but actually you find that you get more and more of it. Um, just kind of interesting one. And kind of going to draw on these last two in my next example. So... <laughs> Thinking about that idea of how do you like quantify, how do you record sort of like your pain, your like terrible experience of your job. And I don't know if anyone else here has um, experience using timesheets, but um, I certainly do. And, um, you know, it's that idea that like, of course, you have to account for your time at work. You have to say, look, uh, this is how many hours I spend doing this per day. And I was really thinking about this and I was like, well, what, what if I made a timesheet of all these kind of other kind of horrible um, mental health experiences I was having because of my job that you can't normally kind of, you know, quantify. No one at your job is going to normally, you know, take heed of this. Um, well, at least in my experience. But um, <laughs> and just this kind of idea that, like, the kind of effect on your mental health that um, bad conditions in a job, well, essentially, that's all the time. You know, it's not just about the time you're spending at work. It permeates all of your life affects other people around you as well. Okay, so what can we do about this? Um, there are a few kind of points that I want to bring up. One, um, which is so important, is um, kind of being able to unionise. Um, there is Prospect, um, which has an archaeology branch, and I believe they've got, um, not that I'm like promoting Prospect specifically, but I, I believe they have sort of um, a special deal this week so you can join um, three months for free. That's always nice. Um, and there's also Game Workers Unite. So now there's actually unionization within the game industry as well, uh, more recently. And that's kind of like a global kind of network as well, which is really encouraging to see. Um, there's also been kind of quite a bit of discussion of anarchist practice, kind of non hierarchical. Um, archaeological projects, um, something that Edison and Morgan have talked about, um, Alex Fitzpatrick as well. And there's even like examples of um, kind of like cooperative game studios, um, which is really interesting. Um, there's a place called Motion Twin Studio, um, where, which is based in France, where everyone is paid the same, regardless of how recently they joined or what role they do. And I think they've been going for like a reasonable amount of time, possibly like 16 years, and they're commercially successful. So that's an interesting case study. Then there's also this idea of having archaeology and video games as a public service. What would that look like if we had publicly funded archaeology, if we kind of moved potentially backwards towards that model? So something that Paul Everall kind of um, suggests. Um, and I was kind of sort of trying to think if there were examples of public service video games. And I guess there are because you get things like the BBC has games for children online, for example. Um, so that's another nice example. So, um, the disenchantment of capitalism. Um, Sarah Perry recently brought out an article about the enchantment of the archaeological record, which essentially <laughs> argues that um, we shouldn't see archaeology as a um, finite resource, which is, I think, a really valuable argument looking at kind of like the effect of emotional responses to archaeology. Um, but of course, that kind of undermines a lot of the sort of legislation around commercial archaeology, which is very much like, you know, archaeology is this finite resource. That's why you need to have these commercial archaeologists in to kind of like preserve it and record it, right? So that's a really interesting tension for me. But also I feel like we really need to ask not just is the archaeological record a renewable resource, but do we consider archaeologists and video game developers and other workers and people in general a renewable resource. Do commercial archaeologists, sorry, do commercial archaeology companies treat their workers like they are dispensable? I would say yes. Um, and I think that's something that really needs to be reflected on. <laughs>
Uh, and sort of coming to the end of the presentation now, I really wanted to include this tweet because it's kind of like one of my t favorite tweets ever. Um, uh, but also kind of like reflects on this idea that capitalism in of itself can be kind of seen as like a meta game. Um, um, Stephanie Bollock and Patrick Lemieux, uh, kind of, they've written a book on this concept of metagaming as being um, sort of like games surrounding games. Um, and they say they're often rendered invisible even as they structure how we play games. So the kind of ideas that are there around whether that's to do, like, as has been mentioned, people's ideas of historical accuracy or um, how they think games should be, how they react to them. And this, it's kind of this invisible thing that kind of structures play. And I kind of feel like capitalism, as kind of Mark Fisher was saying, is this meta game, this thing that you can't really quite escape from how do you get out of it? And I don't have an answer for that because I think that's well beyond this talk, but that's an, I think that's an interesting way of kind of thinking about it. And really, I just want to say thank you. Thank you to everyone that took part in this session. It really means a lot. And I know that it takes a lot of work, um, time, and honestly money to come here. Um, and I really, yeah, I thank you for all of your brilliant presentations. And thank you to Sarah for helping me as well and for doing all the brilliant artwork. And, uh, <laughs> Well, thank you. Thank you.